Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to lecture number six um, of Images, Imaginations and Cultures. Um, this lecture is titled Images and Postcards. Now um, uh, postcards um, have uh, you know slowly disappeared from uh, social practices as we see with the digital turn, but there is a lot of um, you know memory and uh, archival aspects that are related um, with postcards. Um, and what I am going to do in this um, lecture is um, walk you through some of the basic um, fundamental attributes, functions that postcards um, were introduced in the society for and then also bring in some of the theoretical critical lenses um, that we have already covered in this course and um, you know try to apply them uh, to the study of postcards um, to have a more meaningful uh, reflection, meaningful analysis of understanding um, postcards. So, uh, before I even start talking about the analysis, um, let me ask you um, if you are familiar with what is a postcard. And so, um, if you know, oftentimes the first thing that we uh, associate with a postcard is a picture, is a photograph. So, oftentimes they are also referred to as, um, you know, picture postcard. So, um, you know, in, in very, very simple terms, um, a picture postcard is a card that is designed for postal use with a printed illustration or photograph on one side. So, you have a photograph on one side, so it is a one piece of a card and on, you have a photograph on one side of that card and uh, on the other side you have, you know, a space where, you know, you can write a message, you can, you know, communicate. Um, and then you also have a part in that side where you can write, uh, you know, the address to which the postcard is going to go. Um, so, um, you know, over time we have uh, seen that post uh, postcards have become, um, you know, objects of souvenirs that, you know, people, um, you know, travel to places and they collect postcards or, um, you know, people would like to communicate with their near and dear ones and they would write a very brief message um, on a postcard and, you know, uh, send it across. And oftentimes we see that these photographs um, on postcards, um, oftentimes not all the time, um, you know, they are either of any um, popular, uh, you know, heritage sites or tourist places or um, you know, uh, popular personalities. So, so we do see that there is a, a, you know, sort of a trend, a pattern in the type of photographs um, that we see on most uh, postcards. And um, in addition to that, um, you know, postcards also played um, an important role, also plays an important role in societies um, in the form of um, commemorative postcards that you want to commemorate a particular, um, you know, historical event or a particular, um, you know, birth centenary, um, so on and so forth. Um, uh, current events um, and then, you know, uh, photographs of, uh, of uh, you know, um, you know, uh, places of interest, places of tourist interest. Um, and also, uh, you know, we do see, you know, some handcrafted photographs, you know, uh, that is depicting artwork, um, which is uh, handcrafted. So, um, if you look at the history of um, photographs, um, the, uh, you know, we do see that there, you know, there has been, you know, periods where, you know, um, there has been a peak in the use of postcards. So, the initial system um, that we understand which led to the present international postal system, um, you know, that postal reform uh, started in the 1840s in England. And um, 
you know, scholars trace that this reform was, um, you know, mostly, uh, you know, given a result of emerging concepts of the idea of nation states. So, if you are familiar with the idea of the rise, the birth of nation states, you will see the, you know, the rise of, uh, you know, concepts like imagined communities. Um, so, to, uh, to sort of commemorate, to sort of, um, you know, put it on, um, you know, capture it on a frame, um, the idea, the birth of photo, the circulation of uh, postcards we see, um, you know, as early as, you know, the, with the emerging concept of the nation state. Um, and also, um, this was uh, the function of the postcard at that time were um, to establish, to communicate that homogeneity, uh, you know, that uniformity um, in the form of, um, you know, identifying with a national boundary, identifying with a nation state, um, and of course, you know, it's resonating with uh, Benedict Anderson's idea of the imagined community. And um, we do see that over time, uh, you know, um, postcards, uh, you know, the pioneering period of postcards we see, uh, you know, has um, been uh, from the 1870 uh, to 1898 and in India particularly, um, um, postcards were introduced in the Indian society around 1879. And, um, you know, this, they became popular because they were, uh, you know, quick. Um, they were easier way of communicating and they were, uh, you know, fairly light in weight um, to actually uh, send it across. So, uh, you know, so there were reasons behind why the postcard, you know, started to be, um, you know, gaining popularity um, in, in the, uh, you know, in, in the societies, uh, you know, across the world. Um, in the Indian context, um, you can check out this work. Uh, by Sangeeta and Ratnesh uh, Mathur, and it does a fantastic work of, um, you know, describing the evolution of postcards. And the title of their work is Picturesque India, A Journey in Early Picture Postcards, 1896 to 1947. And what happens, um, you know, um, in this description of the evolution of uh, postcards, um, you know, there's also an engagement, there's also an understanding um, of the evolution of postal delivery and transportation system um, and their contribution to the development of Indian cities, um, particularly as early as um, the early 20th century. So, um, you know, as I'm saying, um, these facts, uh, you know, uh, try to keep in mind, try to bring in the building blocks, um, you know, that go behind the scene in the study of postcards. So, on one hand, we are talking about a photograph, you know, that um, forms, uh, you know, an integral component of a postcard. On the other hand, I'm also talking about, um, you know, development of infrastructural facilities, for example, um, you know, transportation, for example, postal delivery systems uh, across uh, the countries. I'm also talking about, um, you know, the um, growth, the birth of the idea of imagined communities, um, you know, for example, the birth of uh, the idea of nation states. So there are these puzzle pieces that are playing behind the scene in, um, in an analytical um, sort of inquiry when we try to um, you know, engage with a scientific study of uh, postcards. So, in this work, you will find that um, the uh, authors have uh, actually collected or, or they, they have talked about over 500 uh, picture postcards and um, mostly um, what they have shown as photographs on these postcards is, um, you know, the growth, the development of, um, you know, towns in India, Indian towns. And so, um, you know, as a result of this, um, you know, these photographs um, are, you know, not just attractive for their um, aesthetic values, but uh, also they are, you know, they are nostalgic records um, for a society, for a group of people. Um, 
and also there are records of a top topographic development of, of a country, topographic development of an area. And you know, um, if you are interested in the idea of development of space, for example, the idea of space, something um, you know that we have covered in, um, I think, lecture four, um, that you know it gives us a sense of the evolution of cities, the evolution of um, you know how towns come into being, um, the idea of town planning, the idea of architectural um, you know development, the idea of um, you know doing ethnography, the idea of um, you know, being immersed in a cultural practice and trying to capture, make meaning of it, um, in this case through photographs or, um, you know, um, simply of uh, the questions of um, travel and tourism. So, you know, there has been, um, you know, a wide range of disciplinary orientations, disciplinary contributions. Uh, to this understanding of, um, you know, studying of photo picture postcards particularly. Um, and this also now takes me back to a theoretical concept that um, we have seen in a past lecture. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's important for us to take another look at this, um, particularly as we try to understand um, the functional use of postcards in societies. So, um, since we are talking about um, the photographic element, the photographic constitution of um, picture postcards, um, you know, let us also recall that what we discussed uh, photographs to be three dimensional, that you know, photographs are both images and physical objects that exist in time and space and thus in social and cultural experience. And this is something that, um, you know, picture postcards um, sort of capture, sort of encapsulate um, that the, con the, the concept of time, the concept of space, the concept of the social and this concept of cultural experiences. So, um, so these are elements, these are, um, you know, factors, facets in the study of postcards, particularly in this respect, um, that will help us gain towards a more critical sort of, um, you know, analysis for postcards. Um, photographs, in this case, when we are looking at um, picture uh, postcards, um, photographs also become subjective and they are embodied. So, um, we have talked about, uh, you know, a lot of theoretical orientation about the viewer and the viewed and the viewed, um, you know, the viewer um, being transformed into, uh, you know, uh, a critical observer of an image and, you know, a, a viewer being transformed into a subject. So, um, I encourage you to bring in that lens here and, uh, you know, look at postcards, uh, you know, with a critical eye and understand how each of these postcards, each of these photographs in postcards, uh, you know, becomes objects of inquiry and the, how the viewer, whether it's you who is viewing the photograph or, or anyone else, um, is being transformed from an uncritical um, human viewer to um, sort of a subject embedded in a larger social structure. The third component here I would like to draw your attention to again is, um, you know, the idea of space. And as I was talking about, um, you know, the collection of photographs um, in the Indian context in the previous slide, um, you know, it, uh, the collection mostly so shows the evolution of um, settlements, the evolution of um, rural and urban spaces. And so space, um, you know, is an integral part, you know, it's a very, very central concept in the study of photographs and even more so important um, in this respect as we talk of uh, postcards. Um, uh, let me also push your, um, you know, inquiry, push your, um, you know, examination beyond um, the space of the photograph that you are looking at. Um, you also need to consider the space of the viewer, you know, the space uh, which is contributed to the idea 
of the subject. And the fourth uh, dimension here that I would like to draw your attention to is that photographs consumed um, in a visual act absorbing image and object together but privileging the former becomes detached from the functional context of materiality. So we are talking about two concepts here. We are talking about the image, the object and Oftentimes, um, you know, if, if, you know, the image takes over um, the object. So, um, you know, we are also talking, you know, pushing our, extending our conversation to the idea of functional contexts of materiality that, you know, the meanings that we attach to objects and me, the symbolic meanings, the symbolic boundaries we attach to objects and, um, you know, uh, placing them in the context of their materiality. So, you know, just to again recall how we understand space in a photograph how we understand, uh, you know, how, how this time space continuum, the time space dynamic plays out. Because if you, um, you know, bring in this lens, particularly to understand, um, you know, uh, photographs in postcards, um, because, you know, almost all postcards are situated in their, um, you know, unique uh, time space zones. And so, um, you know, as a, as a starting point, um, you know, we need to, um, you know, sort of um, assume that um, the idea of any pre-existing space in which things are embedded does not exist. And so, um, you know, when we think of a space, when we um, examine um, space, the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that space, any type of space, is undergoing continual construction. So it is that, um, you know, ultimate fluid state of um, space that is giving us, um, you know, the, the idea that, you know, it is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's under continual uh, construction. And so this now leads to a relational view of space that, um, you know, these, the, the functions, the, um, you know, processes that happen within a space inform the type or construct the type of space they are in. So, um, I mean, if you take an example of any photograph of any postcard, um, you know, that shows um, possibly, you know, view of a city or view of a rural settlement or view of a heritage site, um, you know, just place that photograph in this context of space that, you know, the space is negotiated, the space is relational and, um, you know, whatever the proceedings um, you know, whatever um, the actions, functions are happening in that space is informing that type of space they are in. So quickly to um, view again, bring in the voices of two of these theorists who have, um, you know, given us um, theoretical lenses to look at space um, in a more culturally contingent manner. Um, the first is Pierre Bourdieu. Um, we have talked about Bourdieu um, in um, one of the lectures and I will also be dealing with Bourdieu's ideas later on in this lecture series. Um, but again, um, the ideas of habitus, you know, the ideas of, um, you know, where uh, the, the ideas of relational choice being informed by cultural norms, meaningful practices and, um, you know, how that forms our habitus to successfully navigate social environments. And, you know, once you understand what habitus has to do as a function in, um, in a photograph or in a postcard, because a postcard, again, let me remind you, is not just the photograph. So we are, we, we have already outlined the components of the postcard at the start of this lecture. So, there is a photograph, there is, um, you know, a, a sender, a receiver, um, you know, an address block where you can write, a message block where you can write. So there is this multiple components that comprise a postcard and the very fact that, you know, why that particular postcard exists, 
that you know why that photograph is there on that postcard. So that you know is a whole um, um, you know another argument you know that I will um, encourage you to think about. Um, and so all of this bringing together to understand postcards holistically, um, you know you can bring in the lens of habitus um, as, as proposed by Bourdieu. Um, and particularly because um, habitus um, extends to our ideas of tastes and preferences for cultural objects such as art, food and clothing. So, um, you know, if you are looking at, um, you know, a photograph on a postcard that relates to art, that relates to food, that relates to fashion, um, you know, you would know um, why possibly that photograph exists on a postcard. So a photograph to exist in isolation, a photograph to exist on a postcard um, can be two very dissimilar contexts. And so the moment you place a photograph on a postcard, um, you know, it, it forms one of the integral components of a long communication change chain um, in society. The next um, theorist, again, um, you know, I would like you to uh, look at in this context is Dorian Massey, the geographer who has, um, you know, worked extensively on the idea of space and place. And um, she has worked with the ideas of um, uh, gendered space particularly and looked at what are the social processes that construct a place. And so Massey, um, uh, you can look at Massey's work on for space, the name of the book is for, F-O-R, for space. And then gender, space, place, she has worked extensively on these um, factors. So what are the, you know, social processes, you know, when you're looking at a photograph um, on a postcard, when you're looking at an image, on a postcard, um, you know, if you ask this very simple question, what are these social processes that construct that photograph, that construct the photograph of that place on the on the postcard, um, you know, and you bring in Massey's, um, you know, theoretical analysis and analytical lens, um, you know, it could pro possibly get you to uh, a more vantage point to understand postcards uh, more critically. So. Um, uh, looking at a little bit of um, this history then, um, you know, postcard delivery services um, began in the 1870s in Western Europe, US, Russia, Japan, and in India as we um, talked about um, towards the end of uh, 1870s, around 1879. And what has happened is that uh, this introduction of um, postcard delivery services has also with it introduced several cultural objects. And um, you know, the postcard itself, you know, now becomes a cultural object. And so, you know, many postcards historically, uh, they were uh, they were sort of brought into the society, they were published, they were printed, um, not for sale, not for, you know, that people can go and buy a postcard, but also as a kind of um, gift that, you know, you collect a postcard and you gift it to somebody. And, you know, this idea of gifting, of course, it opens up, you know, a whole era of um, scholarship on, um, you know, classic cultural anthropology. Um, so, um, you know, the idea, the, the, the uh, idea that you are gifting something, um, you know, is of great anthropological influence, um, importance. So, um, and we do see that, um, you know, many places, companies, um, you know, um, shops, etc., they produce, um, you know, private postcards as commemorative gifts. Um, and they mark, you know, certain anniversaries through postcards. So, you know, postcards have had their function of not just, um, you know, a sense of communication in the sense you buy a postcard, you write on it and you mail it to somebody, but also a different a sort of communication, for example, in the form of a gift, for example, in the form of a commemorative, um, you know, object. So, um, so what it is coming down to then is that 
we are looking at uh, the photograph, the image, um, the postcard along with its constituting elements, along with its constituting items um, as a network of cultural objects. So again, um, you know, I am going back to the idea of placing cultural objects within a power geometry and I will come to that discussion in a minute. Um, so, just to carry on with this idea of um, you know analyzing postcards beyond analyzing their content. So, content is one thing that we are seeing that is visible, that is tangible on the postcard um, that you know the photograph, the, um, the writing space, the address etc. you know borders you know photographs have also gone through this era of whether they would have a border of the photograph or not. So, all of that um, are the tangible visible visual elements of the postcard the content, but um, you know there is a larger dynamic that is at play behind the scene to make what is visible visible. And so, um, you know if we extend our aperture, if we broaden our aperture um, to the study of postcards, um, particularly I am talking about picture postcards here, um, you know beyond an analysis of their content, um, you know we, we see that it demonstrates changes in the material circumstances of the production of postcards. And you know because they signify this material um, sort of circumstance materialistic transition to the production of postcards, um, we do also see that there is a conceptual shift in how we comprehend postcards. There is a concept conceptual shift um, you know that is um, sort of altered um, by the development of visual fields in the 19th century and if we for fast forward it to the 21st century you know I think we it same holds true that you know the the uh, you know conceptual shifts of the 21st century and I'm talking about the digital age here um, you know will you know alter how we relate to the postcard um, you know uh, enormously. So um, we do see that um, um, the if if we go beyond just the content of the postcard. We do see that the worldwide, um, you know, transmission of messages, um, such as has been through, um, you know, newspaper publications, broadcasting, um, etc., um, you know, uh, sort of um, is, is is a public way of, uh, you know, transmission of messages, right? Whether you call it a television channel or newspaper um, broadcasting, etc. Uh, you know, they are sort of public ways of communicating. Um, on the other hand, if you look at picture postcards or postcards in general, um, you know, it sort of brings in a change of scale in the form of a more intimate, um, in the form of a more personal, in the form of a more inner sort of a transmission of communication. So. Um, and uh, I'm going to quote Marshall McLuhan here, who said that the medium is the message. So whether I choose to communicate with somebody using, um, you know, a handwritten le letter or a postcard or uh, you know, broadcast it uh, through a television channel, the medium itself becomes a message. That how personal or how public would I like to make this message and um, with. Uh, what intentions. So, um, so of course, um, you know, we do see that um, the function of the medium, so in that case um, postcards as a function, as, as a medium of communication has its own function um, in that respect. So, um, when we see that, uh, you know, the nature of transmitted um, you know information um, you know is differing for these medium of uh, you know uh, these channels of communication. Um, 
it is also important for us to investigate, um, you know, take a moment to reflect on the widespread acceptance of that medium. So, you know, how far do we see that, um, you know, postcards have been accepted in societies vis-a-vis, um, -vis, you know, other modes, other mediums of communication. And, um, you know, if you look at the history, if you look at the scholarship dealing with postcards, um, uh, the sociological inquiry in the study of postcards has been very, very limited. Um, so, um, you know, this is an area that needs um, to grow and it is growing. Um, so, uh, but the scholars who have looked at, um, you know, the forms of, uh, you know, media, the forms of communication channels, um, you know, they have also suggested that, you know, the medium plays a critical role in constructing how we think and how we imagine. And this is, uh, you know, probably going to be, uh, you know, more effective if you, you know, do a comparative study between the postcards, of, say, for example, newspapers, say, for example, television channels, um, and see, you know, how the medium of communication actually, uh, you know, construct or reconstruct the ways we think, the ways we imagine. And, um, and, and therefore, possibly, um, you know, the content only, the content of the, um, let me see, the content of the uh, postcard is not enough to understand that. And, you know, that is why, you know, we need to go beyond analyzing the content of um, the postcard. And therefore, um, you know, to go beyond a content analysis is to also bring in uh, the lens of thick descriptions. If you're familiar with the uh, cultural anthropological ideas, thoughts um, of uh, Clifford Geertz, the idea of thick descriptions, um, that, you know, how does a postcard, how does the content and beyond of a postcard, um, you know, expand and become a part of everyday life? So, you know, how is it um, situated? How is the picture postcard situated in the moment of history where, um, you know, space and time have contributed to building of the postcard that we are viewing at? Um, and that, you know, that, you know, situating the postcard through thick descriptions, um, placing it within the, um, you know, geometries of everyday life is, uh, is an approach that is moving beyond just a content analysis of the photograph. And if you are able to do that, if you are able to go beyond a content analysis of just the image that you see on the postcard, um, then, um, you know, it opens multiple doors um, for you to look at um, the histories of postcards, of how um, they have been produced, they have been consumed, they have been used, um, they have been collected, relished and cherished, and finally discarded and finally forgotten. So, um, you know, to arrive, but to arrive at that critical historical um, you know, juncture, um, this is something that you need to move beyond that, uh, you know, it is not just what you are looking at in the postcard, um, you know, what is, um, you know, going behind the scene in constructing that uh, picture postcard. At this moment, um, I would also, um, you know, um, you know, introduce you to an idea of archive. And so the birth of archive, which is, uh, you know, a much longer history, which I'm not going to deal with here. Um, but uh, also when we deal with the um, idea of postcards as objects of memory, as objects, uh, you know, forgotten, um, you know, the questions of archive, uh, you know, is a natural corollary. I will deal with the question of archive later on in one of the lectures, but uh, here, uh, just to, you know, introduce you to this uh, avenue, um, is that we are talking about this journey, this sociological journey of postcards, um, you know, uh, you know, with regard to the, how they are produced, how they are consumed, you know, the purposes that they are used for, um, and then, um, you know, whether they have been collected or, um, you know, whether they have been discarded. So, you know, this 
is a journey that can be captured um, if you, um, you know, situate a picture postcard um, in, in a time space geometry. The other, um, you know, theoretical lens here that um, you will find very helpful and something we have covered um, in lecture 3 when we were talking about uh, you know critical theory and here I am drawing from that critical theory to exemplify to apply that lens um, you know to the study of picture postcards and um, you know we talked about uh, Foucault's idea of the power and the image right we talked about Foucault's idea of um, you know what is the relationship between power and image and and why do we need to look at um, that and um, in that lecture I um, you know uh, give you a few um, examples um, so um, one thing f um, from here that you need to um, you know possibly apply to the study of um, picture postcards is that um, the idea of power um, you know sort of is activated um, once a power relationship has been constructed uh, between the viewer and the viewed. So, how that power um, you know network is activated depends on what is being viewed and by whom. So, um, and, and that power uh, you know the, the form of power that nature of power then is going to transform um, you know the the nature uh, the cr uncritical human viewer to the idea of a uh, subject right so power and the image um, you know is an important lens for you to bring in to understand um, picture postcards the second uh, along um, lines of Foucault um, you know again I dealt with it in lecture 3 um, is not just the idea of power and image but also power image and the spectating subject. So, the idea of viewing the idea of looking um, you know as performed by the subject becomes important here and I used um, the example of viewing of the painting of Mona Lisa by um, Da Vinci. Um, and so, um, along the same argument is that um, you know why is it that we um, view a particular photograph on a picture postcard differently um, you know in different contexts and so that is the power of the spectating subject that you know spectatorship becomes um, you know central you know a key element to um, this understanding. Now moving on, um, the idea of medium, the idea that postcard um, you know is a medium of uh, correspondence, is a medium of um, communication. The medium of picture postcards is comprised of three technological systems and the three technological systems being one is communication technology that is sort of a visible element of the postal system. The visual technology of photography and the mechanical reproductive technology of print culture in modern societies. Now, these three are very key elements which also brought in paradigm shifts um, you know in cultural um, practices in society. So, for example, the communication technology um, uh, for example, um, you know brought in the idea of you know various forms of medium or, or of communication and um, if you are familiar with the history um, of uh, you know the world or the history of South Asia for example, um, you know uh, print media you know the advent of communication technology the advent of postal system um, you know goes a long way um, to inform the idea of imagined communities um, the idea of birth of uh, the um, nation state. Um, so, communication technology forms uh, you know a very important pillar on which um, you know the idea of picture postcards um, you know rest. And, um, so, what is important um, here is to know that um, you know picture postcards were introduced 
um, as a new media uh, of communication in societies um, and it gained widespread acceptance for, for a, you know, a fairly uh, good span of time across the world. But we do see that you know, after a certain time, um, the use of picture postcards started to decline. And um, you know, uh, the peak after the peak moment, um, you know, we do not see as much postcards circulating in society. Um, you know, as it should have been or as it was during its peak moment. So, um, you know, what they are um, now used for is, um, you know, significant uh, um, documents of social records that, you know, we do see historical um, progression through um, the use, collection um, or um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, discarded forms of postcards. So, um, so it has a long history, um, you know, with the role of communication technology, um, and um, you know, you are welcome to look at that history of how picture postcards, um, you know, were introduced in society, and you know, what led to its um, sort of disappearance from society. Um, but what is important here is that um, you know, postcards picture postcards, um, you know, through that communicating um, technology role that it played um, has also been a medium that constructs socially embodied culture. Embodiment is something I will deal with um, in another lecture, but um, for here, uh, you know, if you imagine a picture postcard um, that it is analyzed not just because of its historical, um, you know, uh, importance, not because it is a record of historical change, but also um, because it constructs, it has been constructing socially embodied culture. And, um, you know, we do see that this element of postcard actually informs, actually brings in um, you know, an important methodological intervention to studying um, of postcards. So, um, and uh, by extension to the study of uh, mass media um, elements. And so, um, you know, when we look at postcards again, just to reiterate that, you know, we need to embed that postcard, we need to embed that picture or image that we see on the postcard, um, you know, within that cultural context. And in turn, um, you know, the viewing of that postcard in turn would create um, or construct, um, you know, a socially embodied culture. The visual um, technology of photography, um, which is the second, um, you know, technological system that has, um, you know, influenced postcards um, to a huge extent um, has its own history and, and this history is quite significant. Um, and, you know, what you do see is that the advent um, of the camera, the, ad, the, you know, a technological celebration moment such as the advent of um, the camera. Um, and also the advent of studio photography with the advent of camera um, gives us the concept of a frame, right? So when you focus a camera, um, you're choosing a frame that you would like to focus on. And in this respect, I'm just talking a very, very tiny part of this visual technology here um, as it would relate to postcards, picture postcards. So when you, when you, when you take a photograph, you have already made a decision that this will be your frame of the photograph that you know you're not going to take a photograph a little bit to your right or a little bit to your left or up or down so that decision to capture a photograph in a frame um, and then to actually use it on a picture postcard you know has a huge significance because as um, you can imagine that there is a 
sort of a conscious decision making process that is going on behind the scene um, in the photographer's mind uh, to take that photograph. And not just the photographer's mind to you know, use that frame, but when that frame is actually printed on the photograph and you know, you know, put in the market, put um, for a general audience, how is um, you know, the spectatorship going to react to that frame. So this is the, um, you know, um, uh, the avenue of visual technology of photography, um, you know, that has a significant role on, um, you know, picture postcards and their history. I mean, if you are interested, again, along these lines, um, you know, visual technology of photography, it's very, very interesting history. Um, you know, um, I encourage you to look at that history also to have a more clear understanding of how not just the advent of the camera, but also um, with the camera, you know, the advent of uh, studio photography, you know, because when camera was introduced into the society, um, you know, not everyone could afford to get a camera, uh, to buy a camera. And so there were these ideas of, you know, going to a studio and have your photograph taken. And that also, you know, spoke to very important ideas of class construction, because even to go to a studio and have your photograph taken uh, would involve an expenditure and not everyone could afford that. So, um, so, you know, it's a very interesting history that you can take a look at, but in the context of, um, you know, picture f um, postcards here, um, you know, visual technology of photography has gone a long way to, um, uh, to influence the evolution of the history of postcards. And um, so here um, in the visual technology also, I would like to draw your attention to to a theorist that we have looked at um, in uh, previously also, um, Barthes idea of the semiotics of the image and the narrative structure. So, you know, what are we looking at? Um, again, the, the, uh, the, the politics of the frame uh, that we are looking at that, uh, you know, we are constantly locating the image or the photograph in this case, um, in a culturally formed structure of social discourse. So, you know, that frame has a meaning and is situated in a social discourse. So, what sort of, um, you know, social discourse are we talking about? And, you know, what, uh, what is, um, you know, the form and nature of the cultural um, construction um, of that space and time um, that this narrative is situated in? So, um, you know, how is the image viewed? Um, you know, how is the image disrupted? Um, you know, all of these questions would, you know, influence the study of uh, uh, picture postcards. And, um, you know, Bathis also builds on um, this idea of narratives through the idea of cultural narratives and the image. And, um, you know, it goes another notch up to actually talk about, you know, the ways in which culture is represented, the ways in which, in which culture is expressed. Um, and, you know, the medium we choose to express that culture. So in this case, um, you know, we have already talked about a comparative understanding of the various medium of communication. Um, and in this case, um, we have talked about um, the scale of the picture postcard being at a more intimate personal uh, scale of communication. And so that, you know, sort of influences social discourses, you know, why I choose to use a picture postcard and not um, you know, something else, another medium to communicate. So, uh, the other thing here is that, um, you know, uh, this cultural uh, narrative of, um, you know, the image on the postcard um, also opens up is that it is also an open form of cultural communication. Um, so, you know, when you write on a postcard and you post it, you know, what you wrote is visible to, um, you know, everyone. And so, you know, whether, you, because picture postcards are not put in a sealed envelope and then usually not post, put in a sealed envelope and then posted. So, 
you know, what you write on the postcard is, is sort of an open form of communication. And that is also an important component to understanding postcards is that, um, you know, that's an element of communication that, again, you're choosing to do. That's an element of communication that is possibly going to be public. And that is a choice that, um, you know, um, you are going to take when you, you are using a postcard. So, um, so you see that you know the contents of a postcard, um, you know the written element of a postcard is you know almost always um, visible as compared to letters or, or other form of greeting cards that you put inside a sealed envelope and you send it on um, post. So this openness of the message, this openness of the medium of communication, has gone a long way to you know. Um, significantly influence, um, you know, the idea of visual medium in society. So, um, you know, uh, it has to do with questions of um, being public or being private. And in a way, um, this, uh, you know, the cards are not only, you know, consumed by the sender that you know if i am sending a picture postcards or somebody else um, it's not just me who is going to consume or, or use or um, you know cherish the photograph on the postcard but you know the entire channel of communication until it reaches the sender is going to undergo uh, the same experience until it reaches the sender and uh, sorry the receiver and then the receiver is going to undergo uh, similar experiences so so i mean the communication journey of the postcard of the picture postcard is very different than um, you know the communication journey of a letter in a sealed envelope or a card um, in a sealed envelope so uh, and that has also been one of the, um, you know, driving forces behind um, the history of, um, you know, evolution of postcards and, you know, their um, growing popularity in the um, communication technology um, uh, part of media. And coming to the third um, part, and this is getting to the close of uh, my lecture also here, is the third component, which is the mechanical reproductive technology of print culture in modern um, societies. So we do see that um, you know the idea of reproductive mechanical reproductive technology, uh, particularly of print culture in society. So culture, if you look at um, you know very very broadly speaking, has gone through paradigms of oral culture have gone through uh, you know paradigms of written culture have gone through paradigms of print culture um, and currently we are living in uh, you know paradigm of e culture or digital culture and so on and so forth so these are very very broad um, you know ideas of how cultural paradigms have shifted and if we talk of print culture as a moment here um, you know the mechanical reproductive technology of print culture has gone um, you know a long way to actually influence the idea of um, you know uh, picture postcards and here i would like to draw your attention to walter benjamin's work the title of his work is the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility and other writings on media and so um, you know just to give you a little background on the idea of um, mechanical reproductive technology, and this is Benjamin saying that when a work of art is designed for reproducibility, that you're designing you know, in a way that it can be reproduced, it makes no sense to seek for the original or the authentic work. And as soon as the criterion of authenticity ceases to be applied to artistic production, the whole fu social function of art is revolutionized. I think this is a you know, very, very powerful quote um, that's coming um, here, that when you are looking at the idea of art that can be reproduced, right? And um, 
So once you can reproduce a piece of art, and in this case, let's take the um, you know idea of photographs, for example. So the moment it is reproduced, um, you know, it doesn't make any sense that we look for the original or the authentic work because once it's reproduced, you have multiple versions of the same artwork, and once you have multiple versions or multiple copies or multiple um, you know uh, types of the same artwork. Um, you know, the, the criteria of authenticity that, you know, which is more authentic than the other um, becomes a very difficult question. And once this becomes a difficult question, then, um, then the social function that art performs in society is revolutionized. That, you know, so art is, you know, in society with a particular function and that you know if when that is reproducible when that is replicatable you know the social function of art then becomes revolutionized so if you see you know the same photograph um, you know on thousands of postcards um, then it makes no meaning to you know actually look for an authentic of authentic um, version of that photograph and this is what benjamin is saying that um, you know the social function of art is revolutionized and um, and his drawing from also is that the technological reproducibility of artwork changes the relation of the masses to art and so art uh, at one point of time used to or still actually decides or defines relation class based relationship social class based relationship and this relationship between social classes and art is heavily um, influenced um, with the advent of technological reproducibility and you know how we understand class based dynamics particularly with regard to um, you know art now becomes um, you know an important um, element here um, to conclude i would like to draw your attention again to um, the idea of imagination work um, uh, from gender geographies of power that we looked at in the first um, lecture because there's a lot of imagination work that's going on behind the scene um, in all of the dynamics that I have talked about uh, in this lecture. And finally in close I want to um, end with a question for you is that how do we consider picture postcards in the context of changing technologies of mechanical reproduction. So this is something um, you know I would welcome you to um, think a little um, more critically and particularly situating it in the age of the digital. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone 
has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.